I'm Ari Gronich, and this is Create a New Tomorrow Podcast. Welcome back to another episode of Create a New Tomorrow. I'm your host, Ari Gronich, and today I have a scribe successes, Sonia Lewis, with me. Sonia is a, um, well, she's a psychology and history um, educated master's degree. She's got teaching credentials. She's been doing all kinds of things with equity and helping um, the communities get up where some of the communities have not had a leg up. And so I I wanted to bring her on today for several reasons, but first I'm gonna let her introduce you to herself and tell you what makes her so passionate about the things that she's doing to create a new tomorrow. Absolutely, thank you so much for this opportunity to be on your platform and to share with your audience. I, um, you know, I consider myself a California kid Um, I grew up in the Bay Area, but I've also lived in Southern California. And so um, parts of me wants to claim the entire state, uh, but other parts of me, my roots of of where I found my identity was in Oakland, California, um, which today when I go back to visit is a very different place than I grew up in. Um, And so that speaks to the changes that we've undergone as communities, especially urban enclaves. Um, that have been hit by gentrification and the push out. Um, But I grew up in the Bay Area during a time in the 70s and 80s um, where my mom was very active in her union. She was, I say, a quasi uh, Black Panther member. She says, I wasn't quite a member. I went to a few meetings and I volunteered, you know, a few times. And that's her humble, you know, reply. My father, when he um, got out of the Vietnam War, he was one of five black officers to integrate the Richmond Police Department. And each of those five gentlemen were within a two year period, 18 months to two years, um, they all were fired for one reason or another. And what we suspect is because there was a very deep rooted um, racist past within the Richmond Police Department, they were not ready for integration. And so my dad tells the story of being asked by his commanding officers to go into the Black Panther meetings and, you know, become an informant, literally like go in and and snitch on these meetings. And my father just wasn't willing to compromise what he knew about his community. And so much so, I I don't want to jump to the conclusion. I've asked him this over the years. I don't want to jump to the conclusion that he wasn't proud of the the job and the profession. He just knew his community. So much so that when he got off work, he never came into our community with his policeman's uniform on. He felt like it was the time was not right. And he didn't want to be that black officer, that token officer that would um, come in and, you know, just seemingly make it seem like it's okay. And so that's like my back background, right? So I always was told for even from a young age, you know, you are as smart as you put your mind to. Um, There's no limits, the sky, you know, dream big and, and do what you feel is passionate in your heart. And I will say that my parents, even from a very young age, um, were extremely supportive of my ideas. They listened to me. And I think that parents should listen to their children. They have, they are very wise, but at age seven, I decided because I had overheard a conversation with my um, parents about a family member who had been killed by the police. Um, I overheard this conversation and it made me extremely sad. And we had just learned a lesson on the Statue of Liberty. And so I understood this concept of liberty. And as you know, growing up, you know, in California, most states around this country, say getting up every morning in class and saying the Pledge of Allegiance was literally like a ritual. And so at age seven, I decided that the Pledge of Allegiance wasn't something that I wanted to say anymore. And I got in trouble very heavily for it. But I made that decision and I stood very firmly on, I'm not doing this and I haven't since then. But I look back to seven-year-old Sonia at times when I'm uncertain about things because she was like, and still is one of the most courageous and badass little girls that I know. 
And I, you know, I tell that story as part of who I am in an introduction because it's a matter of the foundation and gives people a perspective of, you know, what I bring to the table. And if you flip ahead and now, you know, I'm in my 50th year of life, it's now a matter of just like seven-year-old Sonia trying to connect the dots for those who are in the middle and who are marginalized and pushed to the margins of the margins and in, in seeking equity. Gotcha. Okay, so I'm going to ask you some some questions that you may not have been asked before. Okay. Some of the things that I want to talk about are talk are I'm going to talk about them in ways that may push the boundaries a little bit of of thinking. But you're talking a lot about the history, right? So, right. Um, if I were to say, in my judgment and opinion, we're way further behind than we should have been at the time, you know, from the time Martin Luther King started and we, we signed the Civil Rights Bill, let's just say. So time-wise, in my opinion, in my judgment, we're way behind where we should be. So question, if the marginalized community were to take a step back and take 100% responsibility for the speed at which the change has made or not made place, what would you think are the biggest things that they would take responsibility for? Absolutely. I love this question. This is a conversation that my parents and I, and, and I try to bring in my children into these conversations so that we can have some inter, uh, intergenerational perspectives, right? And so from my, my parents' perspective, they grew up in that time area. They were the leaders and the adults during that time. It was to them a matter of having a semblance of you know, my, my mom would say we were given breadcrumbs and, you know, we, we took those crumbs and we started to form lives and, and feel like we were conforming to the safety of and being secure in the, the jobs that we were able to get and, and just being able to move into certain communities where you had not experienced being welcomed before. My father would say that we just completely dropped the baton. Like there was no literally there was no social movement beyond the Black Panthers. And I really, for me, when I look at their responses to that question, I think that it was just a matter of being tired. Like when you think about the history of this country and the labor that goes into being consistently resistant to the practices and norms and the conditioning of having less, that's tiring. That is very labor intensive. And so as a historian, I have to put on that hat that, you know, since the time of, let's just say 1619, when they, the first documented slaves were brought to this country. If we look from that time period going forward, let's say to the civil rights movement, right? There has not been a time where folks on the margins were not fighting. Like this has been a constant perpetual fight. And I just think that there were several reasons that led to, you had the assassination of King, you had the assassination of Robert Kennedy, you had the assassination of Malcolm X. Um, that wears on the soul of people. And I just think collectively, they were tired. Dr. Joy DeGruy wrote, wrote this wonderful book called uh, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. And she talks about intergenerational that one generation is carrying the trauma and oppression from the generation before. And so when you think about that perspective, it's changing the DNA and the, and the psychology in one's uh, mind to succumbs to a certain degree and, and be conditioned to accept that this is the norm and that you can't fight your way out of it. And so I think it's, it's, it's layered, it's multi-layered. There's not one quick, easy answer to that. Um, but I would lean on from my generational perspective because I know that my generation of peers, we were thirsty and wanting more knowledge, but we felt like our parents had given up. Awesome, awesome. Uh, I appreciate that response. Uh, you know. One of the things that I do in my personal life these days, especially, is looking at my own personal responsibility for all the traumas that I've experienced in my life, all the places where, you know, somebody has victimized me or I've taken, my response has been to be the victim versus be the victor in a situation. And so I ask this because I feel like 
there's so much talk about the issues, the problems, the things, and not enough talk about the solutions and how we're going to be together and how we're going to move ourselves forward in general in life. Absolutely. And that's for every culture. But uh, in this case, in this judgment of we haven't, like, we're not where we should be by now, right? Um, in that context, it's like, so where can we take responsibility? So where can the, the people who I would call the blissful ignorant, the people who don't know what they don't know, who are, who are going through life feeling like they have friends who are multiracial, they have uh, love and experiences, and, and they're blissfully ignorant to some of what's going on. What, what is that responsibility? How do those people take a responsibility when they feel like they're being right now attacked for something that they don't feel is in their own hearts? Yeah. You know, it's a challenging perspective and place position to be in. And, and I don't envy that position. But what I can tell you is that the work that I've been doing since, let's just use the earmarker of time um, in last, last May when George Floyd was murdered for the whole world to see, right? And so a lot of people who were in that blissful ignorance or um, Dr. King said woeful ignorance uh, and conscientious stupidity, um, those are literal, you, I, I, I get it. Like if I can put blinders on and I can just focus about my family going to the privilege and, and the, the benefit of the homes that I'm able to live and close the door and not have to focus on and worry about the things on that are going on um, outside of my home in the, in the world, um, I get the safety of that, right? I also get the fear in believing that just because you have made it and you've had the privilege and benefit of um, something that you didn't have control over. I, I tell people all the time as I do this work that you were not a slave and I was not a slave. You were not a slave master and I was not a slave, right? But the, the, the reality still exists that there are benefits that you have from the slave master and there are things that I have taken from me because uh, I'm an ancestor of slavery. And so with that perspective, this isn't about blame and shame of individuals. This is about changing systems. And so when we think about it in the global sense of this system harmed people within this country, the question that I have for people is, are you okay with that? Because if you're okay with a system that harms people within this country, you are forgetting about humanity. There is, in my opinion, right? When you talk, because it's oftentimes these are um, very religious folks that have these conversations that are, you know, the, these good American Christians and we have good American values. And I would push back and say that Jesus walked with the prostitutes and the hustlers. I would say that Jesus was with those people in community who had the less, who were at the margins of the margins. And so if we are in any way trying to model our lives after the, you know, the religious faction that we say that we are valuing, um, then we have to do something different. And I, I would also add that this isn't about individuals taking from other individuals. This is about leveraging equity and resources that, so that all people can survive and thrive and not about taking anything away from anyone. And so I would push back and say, I don't, I can't understand what you're afraid of. I understand the fear and the comfort being a shift, but I can't understand what you're afraid of when it, when no one's wanting to specifically take anything from you. Well, I, I think what, what the question was, was more about somebody who's blissfully ignorant, who doesn't know that they're being uh, any which way that they right. feel like they're just being loving people. And now they're being told that they are bad, that they need to go within and, and find out that they're racist, you know, like this is the messaging that's coming across to people. And so, you know, you and I are on different sides of the nation, right? Right. I'm in Florida, you're in California. We're in right. very different worlds. And so what I hear may be different from what you hear from the yeah. community around, around me. Right. And so what I, I guess what I'm saying is all this canceling of people. I just saw a meme recently about Robert Downey Jr. who was in blackface for a movie. And now 
they were tell- saying, how dare you in the 80s have done that and yeah. you need to be canceled. I mean, yeah. this, is, this is part of, in my opinion, part of what holds back a movement, what holds back people from connecting with others from across cultural aisles or political aisles or any kind of aisles. Absolutely. I, I do. I, I 100% agree that there is this feeling of, of blame and shame, right? Um, so let me take that a step further. In thinking about, you know, I am a nice person and I am living my life and I didn't do this individually, specifically to anyone. And so why am I being blamed for? I, I, I'm so I'm not hearing that in community, right? And maybe because we come from different backgrounds and we have different experiences, we hear we. This is the thing that I I try to lead with in some of my trainings is that five people can be in the same room, they witness the same thing, and all five of them will have a different perspective as to what took place. And so when I think about um, any time that we are having conversations about society and culture and how we want to shape norms and go forward and, and move the pendulum so that every feel, everyone feels like they belong, I think it's indicative of those who uh, have privilege to be able to sacrifice for those who don't have privilege. And so while I, I, I 100% hear you, I'm still going to ask you, what are you afraid of? And so, and I say that blissful ignorance um, sometimes at least from the vantage point that I've experienced and walked is an excuse not to lean in. You know, I I just did a photo shoot this past weekend and um, the photographer was like, you know, when you wanna make yourself look thinner, lean in because the parts that are smaller are going to be accentuated, right? And so we want to lean in in these moments because it's important that we all have a voice and opinion. Like, I won't know what you don't know unless you tell me what you don't know. So I'm going to assume that, you know, most people of a certain age, let's say 25 and above, have been exposed to this amount of history. And even though the histories are taught from a different perspective, state by state, sometimes community by community, right? Um, you know, we're, we're celebrating the 100 year anniversary of the Tulsa, Oklahoma race riots right now. And there have been people who have been saying, this has been, you know, dramatized and it didn't happen this way. And where are the documents? And I would say that there's plenty of documentation, right? There are p- plenty of people who have lived it and they've told this story year after year, decade after decade, as well as there are organizations who came in during that time period who have kept records like the United Red Cross. And so how are you now going to come back 100 years later now that people are filing lawsuits and now that people are asking for reparations, not being able to accommodate the lived experience that oftentimes has gotten swept under the rug. And so I I sometimes think that there's a choice in that, right? There's a choice in willful ignorance that comes along with privilege. And I I would just say open any history book um, that's beyond the K through 12. There there are people in marginalized communities, what you would consider, what we would consider, like my my kids have friends who are black, but they they live in the beach, near the beach, right? right? They have conversations about race and don't feel any of the, the stuff that is being talked about, right? So I guess where I where I like to go is to what's effective, really. And you're, you're a history person, so a historian. So let's let's talk about history because some of this is is a talk about history in a way that's really frying the some people's bananas, right? So so let's say we go to to Roman Empire, Ottoman Empire, all these empires that conquer people and then take over their land, enslave their people. This is like historically not uncommon in any religion, any culture, white people, black people, brown people, yellow people, they've all been enslaved. They've all had histories of being conquered, right? So let's, let's just say 
where does reparations, right? Where does that go to where it creates equity and how far back do we need to go? Because if we need to go a thousand years back, 2000 years back, do we need to go 400 years back? Is it only one culture that gets to have the reparations of slavery or do the Chinese for getting, for going in the intern, you know, the, the, the camps that we had in World War II. Yeah. Um, so where does it go? Because here's my, my thing. I'm all about results. I want to know where, how we're going to get the best results the fastest. As a performance Absolutely. therapist, that's my goal in life is to get the best results. So I guess the question goes to, is that going to get the best results or is starting from here going to get the best results and saying, what do we want next? And how do we make that happen versus how do we punish the life of the past, right? So like I have a saying on this show for create a new tomorrow, we made this shit up, it, we could do better. Instead of going against a system, let's just build something better that people will want to flock towards, right? Absolutely. So, so how do we do that? And I, I know this goes a bit against the narrative that, that you talk about a lot. So I just, and I, and I don't mind being a little controversial here. So I just want to have these conversations so that they're real, so that people aren't going, oh, that's just a, a, a white Jew. Actually, I'm, I'm a Jewish Latino, but, <laughs> but um, you know, talking to somebody and, and placating, it, I don't yeah. want that to be this conversation. Absolutely. Well, I want to push back just a little bit because one of the things that we do know when when, when conquerors came in and they took over um, a land that, yes, slavery is, was nothing new. Here's the thing. When capitalism is involved in a system that um, then created what we know as chattel slavery in America, th there was a huge difference in that system of slavery. So that part, I wanna make sure that folks understand that yes, slavery happened all over this world prior to the Europeans coming in, in during the time of exploration. Um, and so slavery, the concept um, was, is, is years old. You know, you can find slavery in the, in the Bible. Um, the difference at this point uh, was we are now going to make money and profit off of the use of free labor. And so chattel slavery and that forced labor um, was just a little bit different. And so I, I think going to your question about where's enough and where do we start is, is th those are two things that are jumping out um, at me. And so if I were to say um, from a personal perspective and thinking about um, where we are today, I, I would say that Adult communities, before I say that, there are groups in America that have been paid reparations for the atrocities that have happened to their communities. So when we sp speak of World War I and the Japanese who were in internment camps, they were paid reparations. The Jewish Holocaust, which did not happen in America, America paid reparations to Jewish survivors. And so it's indicative for, of us to understand that even native communities in this country have been paid to a certain degree reparations. And my question that I always ask folks are, why haven't black folks been paid um, reparations for the atrocities that happened? Here's the thing that historically speaking, at the time that Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, he wasn't trying to free all the slaves. He was only giving freedom to slaves in the Confederate South uh, because he wanted to still have a strong hold on um, labor in our country, right? And so that really pissed off the Southern states. You'll, you'll free the slaves in our states, but you won't free them, you know, in the North or these new territories. They have the choice of, you know, incorporating slavery into their landscape. And so there was a promise that was made that was 100% denied. And that 40 acres and a mule was a promise that was part of what was promised to, to former slaves. And it didn't happen. As a matter of fact, the opposite happened. Those slave owners who lost their slaves, granted there was a loss, right? You now don't have the physical property of someone else to control and make money for you. That was a loss. But those slave owners were paid reparations. And so there comes to this point of, you're right, where do we start? 
And where do we begin to peel back the onion and the layers of where the impact lies? And I think that we need to do a huge analysis. And, and I think that we've done to a certain degree, a lot of exploration touching on where the impact lies. And so I mentioned Dr. Joy DeGruy's work, um, post-traumatic slave syndrome, because the impact, even myself as not being a slave, I don't know anyone in my lineage who's a slave other than I can trace my family history back on my father's side to a slave plantation in Texas, on my mother's life to a slave plantation in South Carolina. I've been able to do that. I know what my genealogy says that I am. And I know that there are people where the records break off is took place during times of slavery. So my only interpretation of that is that they had to have been slaves. I will also say that the impact of that still exists today for Black people who are alive today. And I say that because there continues to be redlining. We still live through the implications of redlining and gentrification. We still live when a multi-million dollar woman can go into a hospital and say that, and I'm speaking of the story of Serena Williams, who was a famous tennis player. After she had her baby, she was bleeding internally. She went to the hospital. She's a multi-millionaire. And the doctor, because of norms, medical norms, that Black women and Black people have a higher tolerance of pain, oh, go home and take some Tylenol, where she was bleeding internally and she could have died. And that's medical genocide. And so as long as the impact is pervasive in the life that I'm living people today, I think that we have to do a deep dive examination as to where that impact stops. And I don't think that we can go back centuries and pay reparations for centuries. But I can tell you that there is a hundred acres of land that is still on in my family from my father's side of the family. And my family has experienced the lack of support where the two neighboring plots of land who are owned by two white men and two families that have been in that town just as long as my family's been in that town, they've been able to get farmer's assistance, whereas a black farmer and a black landowner has not been able to get. So those are, those are very specific things that we can look at impact and say, Yes, this is, this is where harm has been done. We can look at schools all across this country and say that in certain schools, in certain school districts, because of the tax brackets, right, the tax base, that those schools don't get the resources. We can then look at what the impact of that, because if, they're, that, if those children in those schools that have a lack of resources based on the lower tax bracket are not entering into college education, we can say that th there is disparities right there. We can also say that in those communities that if there's a higher degree of individuals who end up in the school to prison pipeline, there's impact. So we can measure those impacts and that's where I think we need to start. Yeah, I, I, and I appreciate that because, you know, like I said, I, I like to go to what's going to be effective now and, and definitely making sure there's equity within the school systems, which frankly need to be completely revamped anyway, uh, are completely ineffective for 90 some percent of all students, let alone marginalized, you know, communities, special needs, et cetera. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, so the school system in general other things that you think are going to be impactful, you know, I, I, I talked to you a little bit about my friend's movie and um, I, I took his pledge and I, and I put it in, uh, in the chat room here and I'd like you to read it. And then, because this will be the first time that you've read it. This is from uh, my friend, AJ Ali's movie, Walking While Black, Love mm -hmm. is the Answer. And this is his pledge for Love is the Answer, the movement. And I think that it's powerful. And I, if you read this and then can give me what you think about it. That can you drop it again? I don't see it in the chat. Yeah, I'll drop it again. Okay. Let's see. That's right, because I put it in before you uh, came in the room. Copy. All right. Perfect. You could read it out loud so the audience can hear. Okay. 
I pledge to learn about the people in my community, to unconditionally open my heart to their needs as if they were all immediate family members, to volunteer to be a part of the solution in their life during both good and challenging times, and to empower everyone I meet to do the same as if our lives depended on each other. I love that pledge. I love that pledge from a lens of equity. I love that pledge from a lens of um, humanity. I love that pledge from a lens of community. Um, and so when we think about how we oftentimes have been conditioned to uh, uh, what the American dream is, right? You go to, you know, I, at least the, the message that I received over the years was, finish high school, go to college, get a good job, get married, have children, right? And so I, I tell this story oftentimes that my parents did everything literally right, right? You know, my mom went off to college. She fell in love, married my dad. They had children. My dad went off to the war, came back, went to college, got a job, married, you know, this beautiful girl from Chicago and had children. And I witnessed them doing everything right. I witnessed my community that I lived in doing everything right. So now let me take you to seven-year-old Sonia who overheard her father telling her mom, I was supposed to be asleep by the way. It was, I remember that it was a weeknight, middle of the week and um, I should have been asleep but I had to use the bathroom and so, I quietly went to the bathroom and then I heard my parents talking and I stood behind a corner to kind of listen. And my dad was saying that my cousin Carl, who suffers from um, mental health issues, not in the sense of um, like schizophrenia or um, bipolar or anything of that nature, he just wasn't developmentally an adult. He was an adult, you know, he was in his 30s. Right. My cousin Carl was the best kid that I played with when I was you know a kid so at seven he was in his 30s but he had the mind capacity of a seven-year-old 10 at the most right he was he would swing us kids around you know when you would pick a kid up by their arms and spin around in a circle he gave the best piggyback rides he was just like this gentle giant and he literally was a kid and I'm hearing my dad retell the story um, that officers with the Richmond Police Department, no, I take that back with the Pano Police Department, which is a neighboring city in um, the Bay Area. Um, he one day was in a manic um, state and um, he had taken the trash out in his underwear and he had locked himself out of the house. My aunt, his mother uh, was legally blind and um, on disability and didn't know that he was outside. And so he was in the front yard in his underwear and a neighbor had called the police. Not that he was doing anything wrong, but that he was, they knew him. They knew that he was this big kid. And so when the police arrived on the scene, they saw a six foot six, um, you know, almost 300 pound man in his underwear and they ordered him onto the ground and he didn't understand why. And he could not, you know, mentally process what he was being asked to do. And he didn't resist, but he, in a lot of people's opinion, he didn't cooperate either. He didn't do what he was told to do. And he was shot right in front of his mother's house in the middle of the street. And there were neighbors who witnessed it and were traumatized by it because they knew that he wasn't a danger. They just wanted to get him help. And so when I think about the ways in which we interact with each other in community, I 100%, I think that COVID taught me and people in community who have been on the front line asking for a different way, um, we proved it when COVID hit, right? So like people in Sacramento, California, where I'm from, we got together and we said, you know, if there's not enough food, how can we help our neighbors make sure that they have food? If there is, um, 
not if, but there are, there's a huge group of people who are unhoused. How can we help take care of them, right? Um, I used my teacher hat when COVID hit because schools were not organized at that time. And my kids were not gonna suffer because schools were disorganized. And so I started a virtual learning academy. And I said to myself, Sonia, what can I teach that's not traditionally taught in the, in the classroom? And I said, because I'm a history buff, I wanna teach everything about marginalized communities that are not taught. Because one thing that we do know is when kids are taught about themselves, they have more pride in the possibility of what they can become. I truly believe in the mirror. So COVID was a collision of two pandemics, racism, and we saw that so many times be repeated and as these systems and as funds were being rolled out, right? And so I say that we can come create a another world and so this pledge is so indicative of speaking to equity, to community and to hum humanity. And so I so appreciate it when I'm asking organizations to make an acknowledgement that racism is a thing. And not only is it a thing, but we're gonna do something different from this day going forward. Forget what we've been through in the past, but from this day going forward, we want people to lean into this perspective of anti-racism. That's what I'm asking. And so I appreciate your friend for making this a statement for a movie. And I, I can't wait to, you know, watch it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, my thing is like, they just played this movie for the Homeland Security mm. and Department of Homeland Security. And they said it was one of the best presentations of that they had ever had. And, uh, you know, AJ to me is, is such a, an amazing example of being an activist because as much as he dislikes some of the things that he's been through in his life and in the things that he's experienced, he doesn't take it. He doesn't take it for very long to where it takes him out. Yeah. He takes it and he says, what can I do with this? to move my family, my community, myself yeah. forward? What can I do with this to, to be an effect, to create effective change? Yeah. And I guess what, what my disappointment is in many cases is that the messaging is, feels jumbled. It doesn't feel like it's clear and, you know, connected. There's mm. so many different, it's like defund the police or abolish the police or like, no, that's not kind of what anybody's really right. saying. It's more like, right. let's retrain. Let's figure out how to make, the, you know, make them more effective rather than less effective, you know? So um, I think the messaging gets lost in translation so many times with so many ways. But I, I, I want to go back because I, I asked you how the marginalized community can take absolute responsibility for 100% of the lack of, of progress that we've made in this or speed at which progress has been made. So now I'm gonna ask you systemically, how can the system and the people who didn't create the system but are now living by it, how can the system, the politicians, the lobbyists, the people who are active in voting, how can they make decisions that don't perpetuate bills or laws or things that will perpetuate the cycle, but will shift it. And how do they know the difference when so many bills are wired with so many things that are unrelated? Yeah. You know, so how do we, how do we navigate that? Part? Absolutely. Because we need to navigate that to have really substantial change anyway. Yeah. yeah. I so appreciate this question as well, because as a frontline activist here in California, I can tell you, I can't get the number of times that I've been asked to, to have conversations and sit down at tables with our elected officials from the city, the county, and the state level. Um, and so I can tell you that systemically, that is the way to go, right? One of the suggestions that I have made over the years is that um, we need to do a complete audit of all of our laws on the books and then see if our laws even match with the time that we're living in. Does it match the communities that we're serving? Like really and truly. So 
two, three years ago, I sat down with um, Shirley Weber and Kevin McCarty, who are senators here, elected officials here in California. And we as a community came to them and said, this is what we want in a new um, accountability um, law for law enforcement. And we discovered that most of the cities here in California were established in about the late 1800s. And they were actually working and operating under laws that were from the late 1800s. How are we doing that? Like, I, I, I don't get how something so simple and obvious, we cannot come up with the, you know, and bring ourselves up to date with the time. So one response to that is that we do an audit of all laws. Yeah, update. Secondly, okay, go ahead. Hold on a second, I want, yeah, I wanna go there because updating the laws is a passion of mine. Uh, I actually, there used to be a website and it had all the states and all the stupid laws that were still in effect. Like in Texas, there was a law that you can't wear suspenders. Um, like there, 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 there's such a, amazingly odd really? laws and e city by city, territory by territory, county by county. And I akin it to like Microsoft versus Apple, you know, Microsoft keeps piling on code on top of old code on top of old code and Apple just says, okay, well, let's go replace that with something better, right? right? So uh, <laughs> a little difference in, in my world, but you know, the, this water shortage that California has is yeah. because of one thing and one thing only. You wanna know, do you know what it is? What's the thing you think it is? It's a contract with oh, Nestle yeah. that was done in the early seventies that was never yeah. renegotiated. Yeah that gives them water at like 15 cents per million gallons yeah. that they can then extract our natural water that is creating enough water so we don't have droughts and things like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And turning it into plastic bottles. So that's just an example of an old law that has nothing to do with this stuff, but it's an old law that's in effect that is so ineffective. Absolutely. In in the reality of today. And but so, it does have something to do, you know, with the reality of people who are then have experiencing that shortage because we also know okay. that environmental justice is a thing, right? So you can go into pockets of communities all around this country and you will see that there is not, there's a lack of equity when it comes to those kind of resources, right? That, yeah, that was the old, that was the whole thing that happened in Detroit with the water yeah. as well as the same contract. It was the same thing with Nestle, actually. Nestle is doing this all over the place. Yeah. You're a bad player, Nestle. Yes. And I don't mind saying it. Absolutely. So Nestle they had, I guess, an arrangement with the mayor's wife or something, and they were able to then take all of the, the water from their reservoir, and then they had to reroute it through um, these lead pipes because the infrastructure was so bad and everybody's okay. getting lead poisoning. But yeah, Nestle is a bad player. Yeah, but, they are. <laughs> I agree. And so with that, that's the exactly. thing. That, so oh, it's, it's not, not just, just if, 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 if we, we take, take that a step, step further, further we need to identify those bad players. And, and the, when we talk about, at least when I talk about, about reparations, reparations is just a matter of um, making sure that resources from the city, county, and, and the state, the, the um, municipalities that have been um, participants in the um, problems, but also, also identifying I those businesses that were participants <laughs> during the time period. Like there are some big banks today that, that made money was. off of, you know, slave plantations, but they were in the North, they didn't own slaves, slave. but because they, they played a part in that system, I think that they owe a huge amount of money to the ancestors. Um, th when we talk about educational um, institutions, the Harvards and the Yales, they were, which were built by sl slave hands. And um, then, you know, black folks were denied entry for so long. So I, I think that if we do an, an audit in a way that identifies players, identifies laws that are not, you know, applicable to this day, and then begin to, and I, I don't want to say that I, I have a communist, you know, uh, mindset. I just believe that just looking at your friend's pledge, for example, that Community is important. I believe that equity is important. I believe that humanity is important. And if I can sacrifice based on the privileges that I have to make sure that my neighbor is in a better position, I'm willing to do that. 
right now, I don't know that people across the board in the country that we live in are willing to make sacrifices because they've never been challenged to make sacrifices. You know, that, that that's, uh, yeah, I, I have conversations with uh, war vets about, you know, bringing back the draft because um, it gives a sense of civic duty uh, or some kind of civics because we don't have really civics in, in high school anymore. But um, civic duty, the idea of civic duty has kind of gotten lost um, on, on the culture these days. But here, here's where I would disagree. And, and, and this, is, this is, again, it goes to the, to the payback. Um, the idea that people need to pay back. I agree with shifting the way things are and making things so that it's not designed for that anymore and so that the companies and the players that are profiting from those behaviors today do have an end to that profit so that they're no longer allowed so that the people do know what it was that happened that created that but you know I look at standard oil I look at how yeah. the country got built and I go yeah, these people were freaking ruthless and brutal, but so were the Mongolians. So were yeah. every conquering nation, every bit of everybody. And I'm not sure that we can change that level of humanity yeah. because we always need to go through those cycles. The only thing that I, I, I would agree with is learn about the people in your neighborhood and what they've yeah. gone through in their life. Open up to them unconditionally, you know, your heart so that you know that they're part of your family, you know, volunteer to help and be part of the solution and then empowering people now for the future. That's kind of like, I look at that and I go, Hmm, if, if more of the communities that, that AJ was bringing this to would take it, like if, if you were to take this movie, right, and go watch it and then say, okay, I need to take this to the sheriffs, I need to take it to the right. police, I need to take it to right. the mayors, you know, and started bringing that. Absolutely. I think part of the, the problem these days is that the tension is so great because the blame and the victim, right? Mm. So the people that are the victims are doing the blaming and the people who are profiteers of the oppression of others, right? Are mm -hmm. considering themselves being victimized by the people who were victims. Okay. See how that goes? So the, I'll just put it this way. The people in power are feeling victimized by the people that got victimized that allowed them to be in power, Yeah. right? Yeah. But here's the thing, to me, making them feel bad about the history isn't going to change the history or make it's it not. better or make Absolutely. it better. So, so that's where I go. Okay. So how do we get to, how do we develop a systemized way of having communities get together and have conversations that matter town Absolutely. hall events where everybody comes together, not in an angry not in a violent, not in a fighting, not in a blaming, not in a history of my world is all bad. Because I look at the world these days and I go, we're, we're more separated by wealth than we are by color. Absolutely. And more separated by means of power than we are and control than we are by means of Correct. resources. And so how do we without those, the, the, the anger and violent um, hurt, the violent hurt that we feel, without that, how can we bring forth a new tomorrow? How can we create yeah. this new tomorrow and really activate our vision for a better world? Absolutely. And I think that this is a perfect example of what you yeah, meant by I seeing think. messages getting lost in translation. So, so there are certain trigger true. words. So when I do trainings and I'm with groups, the R word is one of those words that are like, oh my gosh, here someone comes in and wants to take something away from us. And what is that going to leave me with? So 
I think that is extremely important if we're going to talk about equity, if we're going to talk about humanity, if we're going to talk about community and the empowerment of all, we have to be extremely um, cautious in when we hear words that we have shared language, understanding and values around how we, you know, build that out. Because for me, reparations doesn't all doesn't always, sometimes it might, but it doesn't always mean a check. check. Right. It doesn't mean a dollar amount. Reparation could be for we know that in this area that there haven't been marginalized people having access to homes in this area. So let's open the door to own home ownership by providing this you know, in a service or a policy. Right. We can look at institutions and say that this group of people have not had access to these institutions. So let's give, let's create a policy that then, you know, creates access to. It's not always about a dollar amount. And so if we are going to work, one of the things that is super important that we do is have a shared language of values and understanding of where we are, are coming from. And I think that town halls, I think that coming together with a variety of folks from different walks of life, not, you know, I, I lead my trainings and I remind people and I have to constantly remind people, this isn't about blame and shame. This isn't about you as an individual, but triggers will come up and let's take a moment to process what those triggers are. Because we all have experienced to one degree or another, everyone in this country has experienced some kind of trauma and we understand what hurt feels like. And so if we take ourselves out of that part of the equation and say, okay, what is my fellow community member experiencing because of the same reality, I think that we would be better for whatever that outcome is that we can build together. Because I, I think that a lot of people are saying the same thing in community. When I say defund the police, they too want to see resources be given to other community agencies, but they don't like the terminology defund the police. Exactly. exactly. That's what I'm saying is the, the lost in translation. It's like, yeah. it, it doesn't, the, the, the sound bites are, are so toxic. Yeah. All of them, the labels, the sound bites are so toxic. That's why I love this format of having a conversation because we could go through an entire train of thought and, somebody will get the full context of the conversation versus taking out a snippet of like saying me saying, I don't believe in that. Right. 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 <laughs> like they, well, they didn't get the rest of it. So Absolutely. I like having these conversations because I feel the, the massive toxicity of the soundbite culture where it's all in memes that have no context that don't make a difference with anything other than to incite more anger and violence. Yeah. Um, and I would also offer this, that we are also living in an age where we see that the cycle of trauma, the, the cycle goes trauma, violence, trauma, violence, trauma, violence, right? And so young people, I am so appreciating in this moment because they're saying that we want to break that cycle, you know, and, and in breaking those generational curses, we would like to see our communities involve themselves in restorative and transformative and community justice and shaping like how we value even people who harm us in community because people who are harming us in community learned that behavior, right? Absolutely. And so we want to help people unlearn those behaviors so that they don't perpetuate that same trauma and violence in the future. And, and in doing so, not negate the fact that someone has been victimized. And so oftentimes it's bringing the victim to the forefront and saying, what do you want to see happen in this situation? Let's have a conversation around that. And then let's address the offender, but let's not erase the offender from the equation. Let's not cancel the offender from a situation based on, especially in situations that we're not talking about murder and maiming, you know, those, those right. lesser, you know, occurrences that are happening in community. If we can come up with ways in which that we can solve problems without law enforcement is a way of defunding the police because you won't call 911 and rely on, rely on them to come out and do something literally that they're not going to do anyway. When you call 911, 90% of the times they are not going to prevent a crime from happening. They are coming out to take a report about a crime that already took place. So what are we doing when we're spinning and fighting 
siphoning off all this money to an agency that is going to make our co certain communities, not all, but certain communities war zones. And then they treat the people in those communities as if they are the enemy. And right. so that, when I say defund the police, that's what I'm talking about. Funding programs so that people in community who trust each other can actually work so to the betterment of their communities. Right. So, so here's here again. It's the language. It's all language. To me, we want to fund the police more. We want to make sure that they have two more two years of training instead of six weeks of training. We want to make yeah. sure that they are well equipped to do the job like in other countries where we where they don't have these issues it's because the police are highly trained they're also paid well for the job that that they do because it's dangerous and so they're paid well they're not as on edge they're you know they're not as ready to fight or flight because they have proper training and um, just like i think teachers need to be paid more I think psychologists need to be paid more. Social workers need to be paid more because we need to address a situation as a holistic entity, not as yeah. an individual piece of a broken puzzle. Absolutely. And I guess the, 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 the idea of having these conversations of, well, we're going to defund the police. No, we're going to do this and we're going to have therapy and we're going to you know not have to call the police. But it's like if you eat healthy food, right? You're not going to spend as much money as if you're eating unhealthy food because you're going to be healthier. Mostly you're not going to be as hungry as you are because you're, you're not going to have the satiation need of nutrients that you don't get with most crap foods, but it's a matter of how do we think about it, right? So we think about food like, oh, if I'm going to get healthy, I got to spend all this money on healthier food. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But absolutely, we're not thinking far enough down the line. And so I guess that's where I, I go is like, I want you right to think so far down the line yeah, at the butterfly effect of what it is that we're doing so that what we're doing is effective, what absolutely. you're doing is effective and isn't the thing that's making it go backwards because you see it, you see it in your community. I'm sure you see the people who are doing the things that you go and, oh shit, why did they do that? They just screwed up a year of my work, you know, in one second of doing something. And so, you know, making sure that a movement is on a page that's um, clear and concise and has Absolutely. language, you know, is to me really important in the effectiveness, right? Yeah. So how do we, how do we get, you know, here's the other thing I hate. I hate when people say the black vote or the Mexican mm -hmm. vote or the mm -hmm. Jewish vote. Yeah. Because it's like, I, I want Sonia's vote. <laughs> I want Eddie's vote. I want, you know, Lauren's vote. I don't care. I want, I right. want people's vote. And so the thought that, that you, I'm sure hear quite often that, um, that the black vote is one thing and not a vast array of different opinions. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, right. And, and and that speaks to I think this proliferation um, in this country that we can we've been conditioned to put people in boxes and told people that this is who you are instead of people being able to have the choice of defining who they are for themselves. Um, black folks are not a monolith, um, you know there are so many aspects and layers to what it means to like your friend, you know, AJ is saying walk while black in America. And so it doesn't matter the, uh, unfortunately it doesn't matter the background that you have, the policies don't match and don't meet the, the line of protection for black life, black bodies and black experiences. And, and that, that I say, and I kind of alluded to, um, you know, previous when I said that I feel like my parents did everything right. Like they, they, the prescription was the prescription and they followed the prescription to a T so much so that, you know, they produced two um, daughters who, you know, went off to college and, and have careers and, and, and things of that nature. 
it doesn't mean that our experiences have all been a, you know, a bed of roses. Um, there have been times as a black woman, I will, my, the former sheriff of my town, I was 18 years old. Now, mind you, I am the salutatorian of my high school graduating class. So I thought that I was pretty big shit, you know, graduating high school. Um, my number one competitor, my parents always told me was myself. And even though Matt Harris, who was our valedictorian, would remind me as we would come in class and, and we'd have these competitions with one another, who got the highest score today on, the, on this test, you know, kind of thing. Um, Matt and I are still really, really good friends to this day. And, and he's a white guy who grew up in poverty. And so when you say that people are more um, um, separated based on economic, that is true. It, it, we are more different based on economic status, not based on race, not based on religion, not based on culture. It is very true. And prior to uh, Martin Luther King's um, assassination, that's exactly what he was working well on was the poor people's campaign. And he was, the reality was, yes, we are black and poor, but if we were to get all the other poor people and we'd have a conversation of what, what poverty is in this country, we'd be so freaking powerful. Um, and so that's the kind of work that I do in community. It's, it, it breaks, you know, um, barriers that are what people might seem when you talk to someone who is the, also the former chapter lead of Black Lives Matter, my local chapter here in Sacramento, when I work with NorCal Resist, when I work with Black and Brown Shut It Down, when I work with um, the API community, when I work with the Latinx community, because we re we've realized here in our community that we are so more freaking powerful when we come together based on the fact that we know that each other's communities have struggled and we recognize that the target on our back is a moving target, right? So during COVID, we realized that the API community had a target on their back. Um, and so we stood in solidarity with the API community. And, and not because I can say, you know, we want to have a conversation about the oppression Olympics because that gets us nowhere. There are no winners in, in talking about whose oppression is greater. But when you can come together on the foundation that we have had some similar struggles and let's talk about how our future generations won't experience those struggles. My battle cry right now is not only is the future anti-racist, but I want to create a world where my children's children don't have to heal from their childhood. Like children today are saying, I'm going to therapy. When I was a child and I came of age into adulthood, I didn't, I could not articulate what, what therapy was, but I'm so proud of young people today who are saying, we need restorative justice. We need transformative justice. We need therapy. We need time to heal. And so that alludes to the comment that I made in the beginning that when you ask where was the ball dropped or, or what is the responsibility that the black community can take? And I would say, being so freaking tired of fighting is exhausting. And so we have to figure out other ways to one, heal, but to develop solutions to get to the healing that we need. Yeah, you know, it, it's amazing. I, I watch, I watch the uh, Red Table, Red Table Talk with yeah. uh, Jada Smith, and um, they had a, a discussion about Black and Asian. Yeah. Racism, right. It was a beautiful conversation. Yeah, it was. It was a beautiful conversation. I, I enjoyed watching the grandmother transform a mind. Right. Yeah. And it just yeah. made me feel like if we could have more of these conversations where groups of people come together and with that open minded heart of I want to hear about them. And then I hear about the the black man who went to the Ku Klux Klan and started interviewing and, and ended up becoming great friends with. And then like once we, it's, it's really hard to hate something that you have gotten to know. It's really easy to hate what you don't know and be scared of what you know, don't know. But once you know something, it's hard not to know that. Yeah. And once you know somebody else's heart, it's hard not to see the heart in others. And so I just feel like 
there's a better way than it's being communicated. And as a person who's all about performance, right? I'm all about results. I don't care about the, the, the BS. I don't care about the, the other stuff, right? I just want what's going to be really effective now at making this better. And then we could reassess. And I like yeah. assessing the laws and auditing the laws. I think that needs to be done anyway, just for, for financial purposes. We haven't audited, you know, budgets. We haven't audited like what we spend on and how we can improve. I remember um, an ex-girlfriend of mine who was an independent CFO and she would go into companies and audit them over the weekend. And she would literally look for anything that was not employee related. Right. And one time she found a $10 million a year overage and expense because they hadn't renegotiated their, their stationary buying in 15 years. Wow. So this kind of goes back to like the Nestle thing on a government level. Right. This is on a business level. And so they had warehouse full of stationery from staplers and staples and post-it notes and blah, 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 you know, tape. And they just, and it kept like all the time coming. So they didn't need to order this stuff for like right. years. Right. And so all they had to do is renegotiate, audit what yeah. they were doing, look at, okay, so what are we doing that's ineffective? What do we want to do that's more effective? You know, and let's right. move it. So that's where I, where I look at life in general. And um, I wish that more people would take this pledge and would, would bring my friend's movie into their communities because I feel like, uh, like it's what's part of the results. It's going to get results faster. It's got, got a performance level to it, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you were to do something, if you were to make a call out, a shout out, to the world right now and say, this is going to be the most effective thing that you can do in this re in this context of what we've been talking about to create a new tomorrow today and activate your vision for a better world. What would it be? Oh, it would definitely to be listen more and talk less. Um, it would be, so that would be the first thing. The second thing that I would ask people to do is to do a self-examination um, of where they can leverage their privilege to help others. Um, and then three, get connected with other people in community. Um, I think when we listen, we learn so much about one another, right? we can't fall back on the excuse of, I didn't know, or I didn't see that, or, you know, um, hold on one second. Um, I think that, you know, listening, and then secondly, just leaning in, it's a matter of being connected and that people being able to, Maya Angelou had this saying, and, and I'm not gonna quote her exactly because I don't remember the quote exactly, but she said something along the line, people will remember how you made them feel, not necessarily what you said to them. And that's that visceral, that's our body taking over what that experience is. So think of it in this way that I might not remember what someone particularly did to harm me. But when I see them, my body is going to re say, oh, uh, no danger, right? Because I didn't know and I can't remember all of the details. But I have to be able to rely on that body, that visceral respect, re response. Yes, please. Um, that your body is telling you something Something's going on there and we have to respect that something happened. And that's our body's way of fighting off danger. And so I, I, I just think that it's, it, we're in, at this precarious place, you know, in the world where we have to listen and that will do us more good. Like ha having this conversation, um, I'm sure hearing a person, you know, of color like myself, a very strong and confident, affirmed 
unapologetic. Some people say that I'm unflinching and that I'm fearless. Um, and I look at my ancestors and I look at women who came before me and I say, I can't be afraid because they weren't afraid, right? Like I don't understand the fear. So I just go. I can remember asking my mom and my grandma when I was in college um, to describe stress. And both of their responses were, Black women don't have the luxury of, of processing stress. When a problem arises, we attack the problem and then hopefully we get an opportunity to breathe. But there are no guarantees that you'll get an opportunity to breathe. So just know that another problem is coming. And so I had to think about that as a young adult, like, are you setting me up for failure to believe that I shouldn't value my life in a sense to take a step back and be able to create boundaries for myself. And so that's part of listening to, right? Listening to what our body is telling us, not just listening to others. And I think that we do ourselves a disservice when we don't listen to others and to who we are as individuals. Sonia, I, I really appreciate you coming on here and, uh, and having this very candid discussion with me. I know I push back a little bit on you, but, uh, I, I do that because oh, I want people to see that we can disagree, agree, have discussions and debates and have it be civil, have it be intellectual, have it be emotionally um, high in the EQ versus emotionally low in the EQ. And, uh, and so, and that we can have discussions that do move people forward. So thank you so much. And, uh, and, and, that is going to be another edition of Create a New Tomorrow, where we are constantly activating our vision for a better world. And just remember, you know, we made all this shit up. We can do better. And the systems that we have that are designed, like if we just repair, like you talk about reparations, if we just repair yeah. the systems and optimize them to more effective systems, we are doing so much in that level of repairing the divide between us and the equity in results and outcomes. So thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And have a good day, everybody. We're creating a new tomorrow. Thank you for listening to this podcast. I appreciate all you do to create a new tomorrow for yourself and those around you. If you'd like to take this information further and are interested in joining a community of like-minded people who are all passionate about activating their vision for a better world, go to the website, createanewtomorrow.com and find out how you can be part of making a bigger difference. I have a gift for you just for checking it out and look forward to seeing you take the leap and joining our private paid mastermind community. Until then, see you on the next episode.